Well, everyone's been talking about the Specialized Sirius, and the reason why they've been talking about this bike is this was just a normal utility type bike that Specialized has, and the range has been out for a while. But what they've done is, is to add compliance to this bike, they've changed the construction and cut off the seat tube and put like a Y frame in there. It's like an upside down Y. And I've got a picture of it here, so have a look at it. And it's a very interesting design. And they're saying that what they've done here is, is because they've created a, a carbon leaf spring, upside down leaf spring. So when you sit on the seat and you press down, that this is going to flex like this, and it's gonna give you more compliance. Now, there is some key factors we need to look at about this bike and why I've specialized, decided to go for such a crazy design on what they're calling basically an urban bike. So this is rather intro, and let's have a talk about this new Sirius. Well, this bike has a number of other factors associated with it. Now, it's it's not been designed as a gravel bike and it's not been designed as a road bike. It's been designed as what they're calling an urban bike. And it's designed to be able to, you know, just jump on your bike and you ride down the shops and you may cut through the park and there might be a bit of a dirt track and you might just jump off a curb. And it's got suspension in the headset, which is that little spring system, which has a history of giving problems. And it also has fairly big tires on it, comes with 38 mil tires and you can fit up to 42 mils on it. And also it's it's also got a fitment to fit mud flaps as well. Now I'm calling it the upside down Madone because to me it's, it's type of the same design. They're trying to create the same thing. They're trying to weaken the frame in a certain point so it will move it will act and spring like like a, basically like a shock absorber but they're using the carbon to do that now i used the word ridiculous on a comment that uh, on hambini's video and the reason why i say this is because there's a number of factors in a push bike that gives you some sort of compliance. And if we go right down to the road, before we go from the road to even the wheel, we have a tire. And the tire gives compliance. That actually moves up and down. And pneumatic tires give a significant amount of compliance on a bike. Now, I'm riding 23 mil tubulars, right? So they're not giving me a lot of compliance. But on this bike here, there's 38 millimeter tires. Now, Tires that big, you can run pretty low pressures. You can run them under 60, no problems. You can probably run them maybe even as low as 40, no problem at all. And I imagine that uh, they can be run tubeless. So that wouldn't be an issue running those really low pressures. And that would give you a ton of compliance. And then we actually move from the rim to the spokes. Now, spokes give you a lot of compliance. And the more spokes you have, you can actually have those spokes at a lower tension. It's only when you have these low spoke wheels, you have to have really high tension spokes. And if you're running a lower tension, those spokes actually flex and they're designed to flex because when you lean the bike over, go around the corner like this, you want that wheel in contact with the ground. You want to have a certain amount of lateral flex and spokes actually do that. So that gives you some compliance as well. And then you actually get into the frame. Now, we know there is a different type of road bike or the other than a road bike called a mountain bike. And they've actually got another mechanism and a shocker ball absorber and a spring in there that has a long history of being successful. And the good thing about that is you can, you can pre-tension the spring and you can also adjust the way the dampener works because if you change the 
the valve inside so it lets more air or more liquid, whatever's in there through, then you can actually reduce the dampener or increase the dampener. So these mountain bikes, you can have them with many adjustments. So it doesn't matter if you're a really light frame 50 kilo person or you're a 120 kilo person, you can adjust that shock absorber and that spring to suit what you want to do for your riding. So that's another thing. And then you even have a seat and a, a seats can be built in, they actually have a spring mechanism. The way they're attached, they're attached with a spring, like it's a leaf spring, the thing that they're trying to put in the frame before it gets to your bum and you're gonna feel any of those vibrations coming through the bike. So bike manufacturers have all of the other components on the bike, plus they already have a tried and proven system of a like mountain bike, a shock absorber system. Now all I would need to do with that is put it on the rear like a mountain bike does because they've already got their their handlebar or in the headset suspension. Now they might, you might say, oh yeah, but they reckon that's an overkill so they went for this flexing and all this sort of thing in the frame. But you could actually do that pretty lightweight and it's pretty easy to done. All they need is to have the cam as they do the fitter on with the top arm, we have a pivot and they can just have a small little shock absorber in there. It wouldn't even have to be that big because they're not designing it to be a full mountain bike. While they can go for that sort of setup, maybe it's cost. It's cheaper to make the frame and cut part of the seat tube out and, and get that frame. <laughs> Maybe they might save a little bit of weight, but at the end of the day, who cares? It's an urban bike. It's it's a bike you jump on, you know, and you probably hang a bag over the front and put a basket on it. You're going to shop and buy a loaf of bread and some milk and whatever. It's an urban bike. It's 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 not. Yeah, it's not a performance bike. Why they're doing this is beyond me. And what people probably don't realise is when you have a double frame bike, that design has been used in engineering for hundreds of years. It's a very, very proven design. And if you ever look up in some factories, you can actually see that they use this triangular framework. They usually have the ridge and it comes down at an angle. Then you have a beam that goes across. And then what they do is, is they have this triangular system in it. And you, if you look at the, the construction of that truss, it looks very lightweight. And that's because they're using this triangular system because the way it works is, is as soon as you put pressure onto one leg, it transfers the load to the other leg and always puts a leg either in compression or tension and it transfers it to a tension force because of the way it works. Because if you have a bike in a frame and you try to push it a point or push it a point, it transfers, it tries to spread the triangle, the triangle tries to spread like this, putting that third member in tension. It's a very, very proven design and why they, the engine is, I don't know, maybe, maybe they have coffee together. Maybe the people from Trek and specialize, go to the same coffee shop, and they go, hey, hey guys, I've got this, why don't we just cut the seat tube in half? This, it'll look cool. That'll sell bikes. And I'm pretty sure that's what's happened. They've just been talking over a cup of coffee, over a lunch, over a pastry, over a sticky bun, and they've come up with this like good idea. They go, hey man, you know, why don't we just, cut this seat tube off, that'll look really trendy, we'll sell a heap of bikes. Well, I don't really see any other reason why you would put this on the bike from just trying to make it look a bit different, a bit special. I mean, Trek have got them and they go, well, we've got to come up with something a bit special and they've marketed it in that mid-price range. So let's be real, it's an urban bike. It doesn't need to have this sort of feature in it. It's not a performance feature at all. They're saying it's a compliance feature, but they've got so many tools in their toolbox to give compliance to bikes already. So it's almost like as if this bike fits between a gravel bike and not a road bike, but a, a commuter bike. It's like a, it's sort of the fits between a commuter bike, a gravel bike and a road bike, kind of all wrapped into one. I don't know, I don't know where it fits, but somehow this bike to me, if you say an urban bike, that's the sort of bike you jump on it, you zoom down the shops, you cut through the park, you maybe go over a few curbs, jump over some a little dirt trail because you've cut through some old block or something or through the trees and, and you end up at the shop or you end up at your friend's house and then you scoot back. It's like, it's just like a, 
It's a commuter. Let's let's be real. It's a city commuter that may be able to cut through parks and things like that. So guys, leave your comments down below. What do you think about this this upside down leaf spring? I mean, at the end of the day, they could have they could have made basically they could have put a basically a leaf spring in there. And it probably would have been stronger and more effective, more durable than what they've done now rather than making it out of carbon fiber. Because all they would need to do is make the knuckle like they do for the mountain bike six side. And then you would just use your spring steel like with a, a leaf spring. Because that's what they've done with the carbon. That would work as well. And that would probably be a lot cheaper and it would be a lot more durable. You wouldn't you wouldn't get that too much weight where you jump over something and then the carbon breaks. Because I'm pretty sure this bike must have a weight limit because you can't design something like that with such a huge amount of variance. And even if they had the leaf spring in there, they could have actually put a shock absorber at the bottom part of the of where they've cut off the seat tube. So that would have actually dampened the shocks and give you a lot more compliance. There's a lot of variations they could have done that would have worked a hell of a lot better. Why they went this way, beyond me. Anyway, guys, leave your comments down below. That's where I'm going to leave it. I'll see you in the next ridiculous bike tech review. Cheers.